Hi, I'm Sheila Kuehl. Welcome to Get Used To It. Uh, today we have a special treat for you, uh, one in our series that we call Voices of Our Lives, in which we just have a conversation with one of uh, our community who has been very special to us, either uh, for a short time or a long time, as is the case with our guest today, Ivy Bettini, who's been a decades-long activist in women's issues, uh, early women's movement stuff, uh, and certainly lesbian and gay organizing and uh, activist work. She's the, uh, currently the co-chair of the City of West Hollywood's Lesbian and Gay Advisory Board, but that doesn't even begin to tell you uh, what she's about. Welcome, Ivy. Hi. How Happy to have you here. I'm glad to be here. Well, you're right at home, too, since here we are in the middle of West Hollywood. That's right, where I live. Where you live. <coughs> what we'd like to do in this series is uh, talk to people really just about their lives because uh, I, may, we might end up with 20 years of oral histories without actually meaning to if we do this show often enough. That's a good idea. Um, yeah, and I'm really happy to uh, have you tell your story uh, to uh, those watching in the country. Um, let's start from the very beginning. Where were you born? I was born in a small town on Long Island. <coughs> Um, the town name is Malvern, uh -huh. and actually, the um, I, I was told growing up that the property line. I don't know how this could possibly be because I'm a real estate agent, and that doesn't happen. But that's a story <laughs> I got that the property line went through the middle of the house, uh -huh. and so I was actually born in Lindbrook because that was the bedroom. <laughs> And then, as I got a little bigger, then my bedroom was in Malvern. Well, I, I claimed Malvern because <laughs> that's where I went to high school. That's where I went, you know, f all through school. Good thing you weren't old enough to vote yet, or you'd have to make a real decision about uh, whether to walk from room to room to, to get a right. ballot, right? right? Right, right. So you grew up in uh, in New York, I, Long, Long Island. Long Island. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Grew up in Long Island. Uh, lived there pretty much my whole life until years later when the women's movement and and now began, and then within a year or two, I moved into New York City. So uh, what was your childhood like? Tell us a little about your folks and sort uh, well, of what they did and what life was like. My childhood, for the most part, was happy when I was out of the house. Mm -hmm. um, I was very athletic, and I was, from the time I was little, I was always doing some sport or another. And, um, but my, my, my mom and dad were kind of short people. As my height, I'm five foot, my mom came up to here when mm -hmm. I was fully grown to my full five foot, uh -huh. and my dad came up to here, and mm -hmm. I was the tall one in the family. Huh. And um, my dad uh, was a happy-go-lucky Irishman, kind of Irish-Scotch, who had a beautiful tenor voice and could play the piano, never had a lesson, Mm. Um, he had had diphtheria when he was a child, and so he was pretty deaf, but he still could just sit and play. And my mom came from a English-German kind of, you know, set. I know and that gesture. My grandmother was just like that. Just like that. <laughs> and with great um, ideas of the way things should be. And my dad never fit into the family. And I was very aware of that as a child growing up. And um, he was, he, my dad was an incredible, we were, we were really buds. You know, we'd go fishing and, and he, he would teach me, you know, go outside and we'd have catch and great guy. And um, my mom was a basically gentle soul until my dad drank too much. Mm -hmm. And then he would come home having had too much to drink and, and she would stand over him and yell at him for three or four or five hours. And finally, at the end of that time, my dad would just lose it. And then I'd kind of have to step in between them and uh, kind of stop mm -hmm. what, what sometimes got to be a very ugly Were you the only scene. kid? Beg pardon? Were you the only kid? I was the only kid. I had a brother who died five years before I was born, when mm -hmm. he was an infant. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, that can sometimes, well, always affect a family as well. It's interesting being born into a family where something's already happened and you don't know as you're growing up until you're old enough to kind of you know know and understand but it, it sort of colors everything that we yes. do yeah so you went uh, did you go all through high school in Long Island and I did I did I went through the Malvern school system 
and uh, it, it, it was a great school system. I, I, I loved it. Um, I had two majors going through, you know, how you pick a track. Uh -huh. And I, I, I picked art, art. You know, so I was on the artist track. Uh -huh. And then I was on the business track. And um, you know, studied all the usual business stuff, you know, shorthand, typing. Um, didn't like math much. Still don't like it. Thank <laughs> goodness. Thank you for calculators. And um, but but I like I like the art the art classes very much. And did you have um, did you have any contact with any information or sensibility <laughs> or anything about gay or lesbian stuff? We're talking maybe what now the fifties. Uh, how old am I now? How old are you now in high school? Um, okay, in high school, I graduated from high school in 1944. 44. And uh, in high school, no. Nothing. Nothing. Um, there, there was a, a young, <laughs> there was a, um, a boy in, uh, in my, one of my business classes, and his name was Charlie. And now, looking back, I knew he was very effeminate, mm -hmm. but I didn't have any words. Mm -hmm. But I just knew he was different, very gentle, liked to hang out with me and my friend Marilyn. And um, as, as we were growing, you know, from about the ninth grade on up, we would practice kissing him. She and I would practice kissing Charlie. And, um, and we would actually have a stopwatch. <laughs> okay, go. You know? And we'd just plant our lips, you know, and see who could just outlast anybody else. <laughs> no. I think the record was 17 minutes. I mean, it was just <laughs> And Charlie eventually killed himself. Mm. And when he, he had graduated, and he got teased a lot mm -hmm. because he, was, he didn't play sports or anything. And, and I lost track of him, but I heard that he killed himself after he was out of uh, high school about three or four years. Wow. Um, so did you go on to college or study I did. somewhere? I did. I really wanted to be a gym teacher. Now, why was that? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. I think it's in the genes. Um, I wanted to be a gym teacher, and I had um, applied to Penn, Penn State on the East Coast. And uh, I was really looking forward to going. And then my mom just decided that she was beside herself, thinking that I was going to leave. And you know, not understanding back there, now I understand, I was like the, the, uh, the safeguard between my mom and dad. Mm -hmm. And so I said, OK. And my, my art teacher in high school was always telling me I should go, go to art school, go, to, go study. And so I said, all right. So I applied to Pratt Institute, and mm -hmm. uh, it's a highly renowned art school in Brooklyn. And they have um, fine art, graphic art, advertising, architecture, library science, fashion. I mean, it's a fabulous school. And it's in a big old brown, several brownstones. Uh -huh. It had a real rickety elevator that you'd get in, you know, the open cage. Uh -huh. oh, it was great. It was five stories high. It was fabulous. And so um, I applied there. And you had to take a test. It was. I think one of the hardest things I ever had to do. And, mm -hmm. I mean, it was tough. Um, and they accepted me. And so I went, I commuted mm -hmm. back and forth. And what kind of art did you, what kind of art interested you at that time? Did you have a, a way, a, an expression already? You well, know, painting or well, drawing or? Well, when I was um, going through school, you know, when you had to do your book reports, mm -hmm. I would always draw my book reports. Hmm. I, I never, I mean, I'd write, you know, six sentences, but then I'd have all sorts of illustrations, mm -hmm. you know, like Silver Chief, the Lone Wolf, you know, uh -huh. and I'd have all these drawings, you know, and three or four pages of drawings, and, and the teachers accepted them. That was my book report. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't really have a style at that point, uh, and when I, went, when I went there, I was studying advertising design, and um, and then I was painting on on my own, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so I graduated as a graphic designer 
uh, specializing in advertising. So <coughs> when did you start having a, either a fear or a consciousness <coughs> about uh, thinking that you might be a lesbian or even any language for that? Well, the first woman that I can actually remember wanting to be with all the time was when I was nine. And my mom and dad took me away on our one and only vacation I ever remember having with them, or that they had. And we went up to the Catskills and <coughs> we were in this old hotel, that, you know, the big houses they had in the mm -hmm. Catskills. And there was a woman there and she was an art teacher. And so we, we you know, I saw her painting one day and, and, and I went out and I was talking to her and she was showing me, she was painting watercolors and she was showing me how to, you know, hold brushes and how to mix colors. <clears throat> and for two weeks I followed her around. And it, I mean, it, she was just, and, and there was a, a feeling, and you know, it was like, it was more than just a buddy, but I didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. And when, and then she left, I guess a few days before we were going, I was devastated. Mm. So that was my earliest recollection. Mm -hmm. But no, I had no words, and I didn't, I didn't have any words all through school. Um, you know, I had the usual, you know, crushes on gym teachers. Mm -hmm. You know, I grew up during World War II, and um, my one gym teacher, Mrs. Buck, she joined the Coast Guard, and I adored Mrs. Buck. She was married to the coach. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it sounds like, you know, like the Hoosier movie or something, you know? Well, you know, I mean, I grew up in the 40s, too, and it's... It is like that. <laughs> it's sort of like, you know, life was simple. We didn't think about this stuff. We had these feelings. Nobody helped us out. We weren't anguished about it mm -hmm. because it simply wasn't even a possibility. Right. And indeed, did you ended up getting married, didn't you? I did. I did. You talk, know. talk about that. Well, first I have to tell you that when I was in seventh grade, I met the teacher who really saved me. Uh -huh. She took me under her wing and I adored her and really helped raise me mm. all through the rest of school, even after I got married. We, mm. we kept in touch and we would have Christmas together and she saw my kids when they were born and wonderful woman. I mean, don't mm. ever say anything bad about teachers to me because... No, I wouldn't anyway. It is and, an, uh, I mean, she really saved me. Well, um, when I was 17, sounds like that that song, when I was 17. Um, <laughs> I'm when, sure Janice Ian will be very grateful that we gave her that plug. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I was 17 and uh, just starting in my first year at, at, in college at Pratt, <clears throat> my dad was a cab driver and had been a cab driver for a great number of years and drove for the local cab company on Long Island. And um, he and I were going to go fishing the next morning and he was going to come right from work because he, he, he worked pretty much till four or five o'clock in the morning. And he was gonna come pick me up when we were going fishing. And I was asleep and suddenly uh, I was awoken with, uh, I could hear a knock and then I, I, you could hear somebody talking and I thought, oh, dad must be home, maybe mom's up or something. And the next thing I know, uh, my aunt, we, we were with my aunt at the time because we had been evicted. I mean, we were evicted a lot because we didn't have a lot of money. We were, we were pretty poor. Mm -hmm. And um, so this was in, one, in between one of those being evicted, now you gotta find another place to live. And so my, I heard my aunt come upstairs and I could hear my mom start to cry and I didn't know what was up. And, and eventually they came in and told me my dad had been killed. Oh. And he was, in, he was driving his cab and he was on Sunrise Highway and a woman came out of a bar very late and came right down at him. Oh. And as it turned out, the woman was the mother of a girl that she and I went all through school together. Oh. So it was doubly painful on all, I mean, there were so many levels to that tragedy. Sure. And, uh, so, so anyway, uh, we didn't have any money, and I thought I was going to have to stop college. Mm -hmm. 
and I didn't even I didn't even tell uh, Pratt. I just went about my business, and I figured, you know, I had paid for that semester. At the end of that semester, I would just not come back. And somehow, I don't know. I, to this day, I don't know how. But I got called into the dean's office, thinking I had done something. <laughs> uh huh. Sure. And his name was Mr. L Longyear, and he uh, he told me that they were giving me a full scholarship for the the whole hmm. all the rest of the years, and uh, which I was incredibly grateful for, and very very surprised. So I I, I finished college, mm -hmm. and I used to. You asked me about getting married, mm -hmm. and I, I, so I stayed living with my aunt. That was seven, from 17 to about 26, I lived with my aunt. And I used to commute, and so I would come out of the house, and I'd walk across this empty lot across the street, and I'd go to the main road, and then I'd walk to Long Island Railroad. And that, I, I did that for, you know, a couple of years. And then um, I was, starting to be very aware that I was very attracted to girls, you mm -hmm. know. Although I still didn't know what that meant. I figured it was just me, the only one in the whole world, and so don't say anything to anybody. So um, there was a, um, okay, so I went to school, that's right, and I finished school, and I get my first job in the city, and <clears throat> it's with an advertising company that I designed bus cards that you put in buses, uh -huh. you know, and there was um, a whole bunch of whole bunch of real neat women there, and um, one I really got oh my, just so charming. So she was going out with somebody, and um, she said, "Well, I'm sorry, you, don't, you know, you don't have a date because we could double date." And I thought, "I'm getting the date." <laughs> so. <laughs> so I, there was, there was, I knew there was this boy, young man across the street, kind of catty cornered from where I lived now for about 10 years. And um, so I saw him one day and I asked him if he would double date with me and we could go with my friends. So he said, yeah. And that ended up being the man I married. <laughs> and it turned out that he, to this day, has very bad asthma. and. He was in bed for two years, mm. and he watched me walk through the lot mm. every morning. It, he told me later it was sort of the way he started his day. Mm. You know, he would watch me walk through, and he said, I really wanted to get to know you, but I didn't know what to do, you know. Mm. So it was, um, so I literally married the boy across the street. And how long were you married? 16 years. And kids? I have two daughters. Where are they now? Um, the older one who was 47, Sheila. Oh my! No, no, no. We don't have children who are 47. I know <laughs> that. I keep going. It's not possible. Where did this happen? You know, <laughs> she lives in um, in Manhattan on the east side, uh, downtown, and my younger daughter, who's 43, lives in Greenwich, Connecticut, and she has my grandson, who's 17. Uh huh. And she's married to her wonderful second husband uh, by the name of Charlie. I have a lot, seem to have a, a lot, lot of Charlies, Charlies in, in your my life. life. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking. And how was your marriage? Did you, um, I mean, I, I know people are interested to, to understand how it is that uh, so many women in our generation, probably all of us in our generation, have been serially heterosexual and, and gay and lesbian, if you know what I mean. Because we're, I mean, that was really the choice and and I don't know that a lot of us were really unhappy. Uh, I wasn't unhappy. No. <clears throat> let, me, let me just, the, the week I was supposed to get married, now Eddie and I went out for about a year, maybe a little longer. And he, he is a very decent, loving man, very gentle. And so now the week I'm supposed to get married, that Saturday. And all of a sudden, I wake up on Monday and I can't swallow. I can chew a lot, <laughs> but <laughs> it won't go down, you know? Uh. And so by midweek, um, I called my mom's twin sister, who was always, I was always very close to. She was like my favorite. 
And um, <clears throat> she said, all right, I'll come over. So, okay, so she comes over, but it's still not doing it, but I can eat a little bit. So I call my doctor, my regular doctor that had, from the time I was little, mm -hmm. I went to this man. And <clears throat> I, I explained, I said, I can chew, but I, you know, it's like my throat is locked up. And he said, well, what's going on? And I said, oh, I forgot to tell you, I'm getting married. <laughs> so he said, well, I don't think it's physical, so why don't you go talk? There's a psychiatrist friend of mine, and why don't you go talk to him? Now, nobody back there. No, of course not. Ever said the word psychiatrist, therapist. I mean, I don't even think the word therapist was around. It was psychiatrist. And I could feel myself going, oh, my God. And so he said, here's the phone number and call him up. And so I, so I did and uh, made an appointment with him. And, and I thought, well, I can't let anybody know I'm going to a psychiatrist. And so I didn't take my car because I was so active in sports <laughs> uh -huh. that I had, a little, I had a little 36 Ford, 1936 Ford. And I was so active in sports, I just assumed everybody on Long Island would see my car and know exactly where I was going. Uh -huh. That's how crazy you, you, of course. you, you know, oh my God. So I took the bus, and I hate the bus, to this, I won't even ride the bus today. <clears throat> so I take the bus, and it's about a 35 minute ride to Freeport from where I live. So I go over there, and I go into the building, go up, and I go into this waiting room, and the door opens, and a, and a voice says, come in. And so I walk into this room. Now, Sheila, this is all I remember of, I'm assuming, a session. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. I walk in, and here is this man sitting behind this big psychiatrist mahogany desk. You know, as you, when you think of a psych, you know, uh -huh. huge desk. And it felt like he was like 18 miles away from me. And I walk in, and I stood in front of his desk. He didn't, he didn't even say, sit down. Hmm. I stood there, and he said, um, why are you here? And I didn't expect that question. And so out of my mouth fell, I think I love women. It was like, I think I love women. You know? And then I went, where did that come from? Because wow. I had never even formulated those words in my mind. I just went, boom. And so he, as he said to me, and, I, and this is all I remember the session, he said to me, have you ever kissed a woman? And I, and, I, and I was shocked. I said, no, I had never even thought of it. Mm -hmm. I said, no. And he said, you are not homosexual, just like that. <laughs> and he said, he said, go get married and cleave. He actually used the word cleave. Even then I knew that was a word that was weird. Uh -huh. And he said, and cleave unto your married friends. Because I had all these sports friends, all these basketball buddies, right, the and occasion, baseball and field uh, The occasion of sin. Yes. Yes. Uh-huh. Oh, and he even said, and give up your basketball team, which I was coaching. Mm -hmm. You know, give up all of that and cleave until you're married friends. Mm. That's all I remember from the session. And so, you know, I think I genuflected and kissed his ring. I'm not <laughs> sure. But I left and, and I got married that Saturday. Mm. And I did exactly what he told me, gave up all my sports, mm -hmm. and I cleaved, cleaved, clothed to all my married friends and fell in love with them. Mm -hmm. So nothing changed, right. you know, I just shifted locations where the women, I fell in love with my friend Esther Siegel, you know, and a woman at, at my job, well, I was working for Newsday, so, you know, I had a woman I was in love with it at my job and in my social circle. So it was mm -hmm. very nice, but mm -hmm. they never knew it. Mm. You know, but that was my experience of trying to deal with what I was feeling. That was the limited experience I had, never to be spoken of again until many, many years later. So you're um, working at Newsday. <clears throat> Did you go to work at Newsday? Have two little girls. Yep. Um, takes us into the 60s, I think. A, sort of a, yeah. a dangerous time for all of us, time of incredible change and transition. And was that true in your life as well? Oh, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. Up until 1966, um, I got married in 53. My 
My first child was born, I got married in 52. My first child was born in 53, my second child was born in 56. And then I had a third pregnancy that I lost in 59. <clears throat> and so I, was, I worked here and I worked there, but mainly I was working at Newsday. And then in 1966, the, the reporter that I had this mad, mad crush on, she, uh, we were going to have lunch. And I normally didn't, you know, I went in kind of late, and then I'd work into the evening. And so she called me. We were going to have lunch about 12.30 or something. <clears throat> and she called me when I got into the art department, and she said, can't have lunch. I have to go interview some, I don't know, some, I don't know, they're doing some new women's group. I have to go to New York. And she was disgusted because she didn't want to drive into New York because <laughs> this was on in Garden City, Long Island. Uh -huh. oh, it was like 35, Forever. 40 miles. Sure. You know. So I said, all right. So she leaves, and about 6.30, the phone rings. And I'm in the art department, and, and she goes, hi, I'm back. I said, oh, good. She said, uh, we can have dinner if you want, but get in here right now. So I said, okay. So I hung up and go running into the city room. And, and I go over to, and she's typing madly. And she thrusts this paper at me, you know, kind of like, here, sign this. You know, and I said, what is it? She said, don't even ask me now, just sign it. And I, you know, I did. I mean, I would have given a five, my firstborn. You want my, <laughs> my mo yeah, you can have that house too. <laughs> you know? uh -huh. I mean, I just adored her. So I signed this paper and I went back back to work and later she calls and she said, okay, let's have dinner. So I said to her, what did I sign? She said, you joined the National Organization for Women. Huh. It, it was a membership form. Uh -huh. She said, that's what I went in to interview. It's a woman by the name of Betty Friedan. She wrote this book, Feminine, Feminine Mystique, and they announced this formation of, of this new organization. And you just joined it. <laughs> I said, fabulous. And I thought, what? You know, because I hadn't read the book. And as, you know, as it turned out, that moment that I signed that paper was about to change my, my life in just about the most, the most, every facet of my life changed. So what was now at that point? Now was a national organization, didn't have any chapters. Um, it now was this um, organization based on feminism. Who knew? You know, I went home, looked it up. Uh -huh. <laughs> I didn't you couldn't even find it anywhere. <laughs> and it, it, Betty Friedan and eleven other, I think, women um, formed the organization as a result of President Kennedy's, Kennedy's uh, commission on the status of women, where. For Dan and these other women served along with the guys. And at the end, I think they met for about three years, and at the end, the guys basically said to them, okay, thanks a lot, girls. You were great. Now, mm -hmm. we'll, 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 we'll get the report done and we'll let you see a copy of it. And that so infuriated them that the story goes, they went out to some club, uh, some cafe or something in Washington, D.C. that day, all sat around the table and decided, after martinis and whatever else, Betty Friedan, incidentally, loves to drink vodka on the rocks with pepper, black <laughs> pepper. It's quite good. <laughs> so they sat there and doodled acronyms. Mm -hmm. And when they got to now, they thought, and they made National Organization for Women. And it's not of women. A lot of people make that mistake, but it's right. for women. So you joined this chapter, which didn't exist yet. It, no. So you were one of the we founding were members of, of the first chapter of now. So that was in New York. That happened to be in New York City. Uh huh. Right. I don't know whether there would be any connection to sort of sexual orientation stuff, but I, I think there mm -hmm. was probably, as I understand your story, kind of over the evolution of your feminism, also mm -hmm. an evolution of your own kind of understanding that you were a lesbian. Well, there, um, I mean, even as I was getting involved, I, I, I suddenly was starting to have an awareness that there were going to be a lot of women there, you know, and on some level I understood that that was going to be very important 
for me. And I wish I could say I joined now out of some deep-seated political conviction, but it was really out of lust <laughs> <laughs> for this woman. When she said, sign the paper, I signed it. Um, Except that can't be the reason why you became the chapter president. No, no. I mean, I come quickly, on, Ivy. <laughs> I quickly understood exactly what it, what it was about. As we were all, I mean, it was one of those great adventures because there were no, there were no, no maps. You know, it had never been done before. Um, we didn't know where we were going. Every day was like creating new footprints in the sand where there had never been any. Mm -hmm. And um, I became the, I think, the second or third president, official president. Um, and I was kind of brought in uh, to, to uh, th there was a split in the chapter. Mm -hmm. There was a group of people who wanted to run it by consensus, and then there was a group of people who wanted to run it, you know, like a corporation type thing. And um, I was brought in to bring them all together, and, and that's kind of been my role, role, role in the community, too. You know, it's sort of... Well, I was interested when you were talking about consciousness raising, because I remember that I mean, I hardly knew anybody in the 70s that wasn't in a consciousness raising group. <clears throat> um, but there was no such thing when you no. first started and now. No. In uh, 1968, uh, when, when I became president, I had observed and had gone to one or two times, not a lot, um, there were a group of lesbians in the village. And they were doing what they called lesbian consciousness raising. And so I went a couple of times, and I, w I was in the f first or second group, can't remember, but there's, since there's been, I think they're up to number 289 or something. You know, they just mm -hmm. kept spinning off groups. Mm -hmm. And I was so impressed on how they were looking at the lesbian issue, or, or, or lesbianism, that I, I thought, what a great... Um, organizing tool this would be in now. Mm. So I went back to my chapter and, and created this whole series this, uh, of eight topics um, about feminism, with the underpinning being feminism. And um, introduced, at first I had my board go through it, and we had a great time. And um, you, you know Warren Farrell? Mm -mm. Warren Farrell started the men's movement. Mm -hmm. Well, he was in my chapter. Hmm. And he was coming when, when we finally the board loved it and we realized that it would, would be fine, it was going to work. And we started to, you know, have other, other uh, membership would be going through it. Warren Farrell was one of the ones. And I just saw him on television yesterday morning. Mm. Um, he's written several books about mm -hmm. the men's movement. And... and um, and and because now we always had men, it's, you know, four women, so there were always men members. And but consciousness raising, when with the topics, I mean, there were topics like um, rape, the tool of the oppressor. Um, uh, do women like other women? Really like other women? Mm -hmm. You know, what's the conditioning? Can mm -hmm, I really mm -hmm. like you as a person? Or what's the competition? You know, you know, all the feminist stuff. And, uh, you know, things like, um, um, is feminism uh, a lesbian issue? Now, that's an interesting <coughs> question, because there was a flip side of that that really got to be kind of a hot topic for now, as I remember, in terms of the question of whether lesbianism was a feminist issue. Right. And it got to be pretty um, divided <coughs> on that. Were you part of that? Oh, God, yes. <laughs> Oh, big part, yeah, a very, a very painful part of my life. Um, the initial impetus of now um, and feminism was really on equality as far as work, uh, compensation, <clears throat> you know, all the kind of um, economic issues. But it was not organized to go below that. That was not where they began. Um, and, and consciousness raising took you below, took you underneath, it took you down, you know, below the belly of this beast of sexism and patriarchy. 
And, and, and so suddenly, <coughs> uh, consciousness, uh, CR, mm -hmm. we were looking at, at issues underneath all the, the, the icing kind of stuff that mm -hmm. you had, to, as women, we had to deal with. And um, that became the argument. Uh, is this a civil rights organization or is it an equal rights organization? Began as an equal rights organization. It's a civil rights organization. Mm -hmm. You can't have equal rights unless you get to the civil rights. So that was the split. And um, <clears throat> in when my last year as president, I did a uh, panel. I would I, we would have like panels like once a month or once mm -hmm. every couple of months. <coughs> And, and, and I did the panel on, is lesbianism a feminist issue? Um, and there were 15, 14 people, on, 14 women on the panel. I was the moderator. The only women that were out lesbians and that I knew were lesbians except for myself, and I hadn't really come out, 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 mm -hmm. was Barbara Love and Sidney Abbott, who wrote Sappho's A Ride on Woman. Mm -hmm. Everybody else, was 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 heterosexual mm -hmm. for all intents and purposes. A whole bunch of them now are, mm -hmm. but at that time they were, and um, it was fascinating. Um, the place was packed. There were nearly four hundred people that came to that panel. Normally, you had fifty or sixty in the audience mm -hmm. because we advertised in the Times every month. We would advertise in the Times. And that, that room was, was packed. <coughs> and at the end, the feedback that came back over the next week or two, everybody in the audience thought everybody on the panel was a lesbian. Mm -hmm. Because it was like they said, well, well, they must be, because why would they, why would they be talking it? about it? Sure, of course. You know, I mean, you got to be. But it cost a larger <laughs> brouhaha than that, didn't it? Because I think it cost you your presidency. Yeah, it did. Um, Betty Fidan, um, we, we were fairly close. Uh, we lived in the same brownstone complex, mm -hmm. as did the reporter from Newsday, the three of us. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, so I, I saw her a fair amount of time, and we would travel together to certain places you know, that we would go. And I could see her getting more and more agitated as I was pulling the lesbian issue out of the closet, mm -hmm. and which, which I found out was making some of the closeted gay women, they didn't identify as lesbians because that was too political, mm -hmm. they were a gay woman, <clears throat> they became really terrified. I remember there was two women, especially, that I hung out with, you know, and we'd go dancing together and we, you know, we'd have dinners and they were the ones that really started the first purge because now it's had several purges of involving lesbians, lesbians right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so the first purge, they really agitated. You know, look what she's doing. You know, she's going to have all these lesbians. In the, because they didn't want to be pulled out of the closet, which I never would have done. I mean, sure. I could have at any time for like a year and a half. Mm -hmm. I you know, never would have done that. So um, she got, for Dan was a member of the chapter, and a whole bunch of the national people who were living in New York were members of my chapter and they started this whole rumor campaign about a month and a half or two before the elections where I was running again and about a month before the election I got a phone call from Barbara Love and Sidney Abbott and Barbara was on the phone and um, she said Ivy they're out to get you and they're stacking the meeting um, there's a rumor mill going saying awful things about you. You know, like I, I was seducing this one and that. I should have only been so lucky. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't true. And, but they had all these rumors going and, and some of the women who were, um, to this day, I'm not sure of their sexuality. They're still in there. Mm -hmm. I, I'm still not sure of their sexuality. And they were panicking. Mm -hmm. And so one, one especially, I mean, she was just oh so hateful with the rumors she got going. And she said, and Barbara Love said, we've got about 30, 40 lesbians, and we want to come down the next meeting. We're going to join, and so we'll be able to vote. And, and I said, no, you can't do that. That's not fair. You're not interested in now, and I have faith in the membership.
you know. Famous just, last words. Famous. There were two, two things in my life I said, you know. That was one of them <laughs> where I thought, oh my God. Anyway, uh, I was totally wrong. Uh, the night of the election, there were almost 400 women in the room. Brand new members. Had never seen 98% of them. Mm -hmm. And many of them uh, were paper members, you know, never came to a meeting, you mm -hmm. know. <clears throat> and and uh, and uh, I was they they put this uh, because nobody was running against me, except they put this one woman up to run against me who had been in the chapter three months, had never even seen her, and she ended up winning. Mm -hmm. And I never saw her again. I mean, I think she came to two meetings. You know, I went home, sat in the chair for a month after work every day, going, "What happened?" <laughs> you know. You were really depressed, huh? Oh, I was. I was so wounded. I was well, I mean, wounded. I can. I understand, but it's you know, it's happened to so many people. Charlotte Bunch tells this story, and uh, a number of women who really had put their hearts into the early feminist movement because it appealed to so many of us. It was like it was like hearing women's music for the first time, or you know, just thinking, "Oh my gosh, there's something here that." finally speaks to me and makes yeah, sense it's mine. It's mine. and then to put so much sweat blood and tears into mm -hmm. it and have it turn on you on the basis of this issue which is one of the most central issues really <coughs> about feminism which really goes <coughs> to issues of gender and you know well I think it's the bottom line of feminism um, I mean when when the world cannot control you any other way They'll say, what are you, a lesbian? And that sends most women scurrying right back where they came from, back into the house, taking care of the kids, or right. don't try for the promotion. Or, I, mean, I honestly believe it's the bottom line. Well, it is interesting because your work ended up then being primarily in the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender movement. Right. Um, not, I think, because it was the only thing left to you, but because I think it it appealed to you, but because um, I know you came to California um, and you were involved in early on came out here in, in the Gay and Lesbian <laughs> Center here in LA, I think. Yep. Um, and, uh. and it was interesting to me because we sort of had no home at all at that point. In the women's movement, they were, you know, lifting their skirts away from the lesbians, certainly didn't want to be identified with lesbians. The gay movement was a gay movement, pretty much. That's right. I mean, it, it was, was the guys. Yeah. <laughs> so what was it like at the center? Pretty much the same. <laughs> um, I got a job as the women's director of the women's department, and we had two rooms, uh -huh. and that was it. I mean, we were invisible, and you know, in that building on on Highland, um, that that was our turf. But other than that, it was very male. We happened to have at the time, Susan Cuna was acting as interim director, um, which was good because it was another woman that had some, some um, uh, authority that I could go to if we had a problem. But it was very, it was very male, mm -hmm. very male, very male valued. So how did you get more women interested in the center? <clears throat> I didn't. I really didn't. Um, I mean, I took my department out and we would put on programs, mm -hmm. you know, for women's organizations. But in the center, um, it, it felt initially like, like swimming upstream mm -hmm. against a real strong current. Mm -hmm. And that was 76, mm -hmm. <clears throat> 70, late 75, 76. And on the heels of that, Anita Bryant was agitating in Florida. Mm -hmm. around um, gay men and trying to do initiatives against mm -hmm. the gay, gay male community. <coughs> um, nothing about lesbians. I'm not even sure she knew there was a lesbian. I, but um, I read a little, uh, like this much in the LA Times, one column, an inch deep, something about Anita Bryant in Florida is working, trying to get an initiative, blah, blah. And I thought, oh, God, it's coming here. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's like some of those things you know, you know things in life suddenly you know. Mm -hmm. and, and I thought, now what can I do? So I, yeah, I heard there was a meeting for something else <clears throat> over at a house, uh, and the man's name was Morris Kite. Hmm. And so I showed up at that meeting, 
And within a couple of weeks, we started to talk about Anita Bryant. <coughs> <coughs> and we formed the campaign, um, campaign for Human Rights. Mm -hmm. No, I'm sorry. Human Rights Coalition. Mm -hmm. There is a campaign for Human Rights. Human Rights Coalition. And so for the next two years, we organized the community. And after one year, John Briggs, Senator John Briggs, mm -hmm. your, your glorious capital. <laughs> um, it's a little more glorious now, I have yes. to say. Oh, okay. good, good. Well, uh, he was just awful. <clears throat> and he started to uh, talk about an initiative called the Briggs uh, Initiative. And it would have gotten rid of all teachers, all homosexual teachers, or any teacher who supported homosexual rights or spoke out in defense of someone who was gay, they would have been gone. They, on the spot, they could be fired. And so we started organizing grassroots, and, and then Gail Wilson, um, loved Gail, uh, lesbian realtor, mm -hmm. and her, her office is still there, Gail Wilson Realtors on San Vicente. And um, she, she started to organize, and um, suddenly there was a man by the name of David Mixner, and then Peter Scott, and suddenly oh, there were all these names floating around me. And finally Gail said to me, um, <clears throat> why don't you come work for the campaign? Go talk to David Mixner. So I did, and I was hired on as deputy director of the No One Six campaign. And I took a sabbatical leave from the center, and when we won the Briggs Initiative, you know, by a handy margin, mm -hmm. um, Gail said to me, don't go back to the center, get your real estate license and come with me, which I did. So I never went back to the center. Huh. I never went back to the male bastion at the time. But it uh, certainly didn't take you away from activism. And I was, I was interested in, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting when you've had such a long experience, especially with two fledgling movements. And the kind of theoretical work, and we, it's only in hindsight that we really think as activists about the theories that engaged us or the theories of the movements that made us do what we did. But it was interesting when you said there was this split in terms of sort of the philosophy in the early women's movement in now uh, about whether it would be about civil rights or equal rights. And a lot of people don't really know if there's a difference. Right, they think it's um, one and the same. Yeah, but you also have talked to me about this notion that you think there's a difference between uh, the work you do in a movement, and I can't remember quite how you put it, between assimilation. And affirmation. And affirmation, will you explain that? Um, well, right now there's, there are uh, um, a lot of people who believe in assimilation that our movement, it will be wonderful when there is no difference, mm -hmm. when we are all one society, and, and how nice it will be. And it'll be nice for the culture that dominates now, because that's exactly what will be there when we assimilate into it. Um, that's not going to change. That's dominant by huge percentage points that's the dominant culture. I believe in affirmation, uh, being who we are, protecting and maintaining our communities, our cultures. And we do, we do, we do have cultures. We are incredibly creative people. We are. We get through the most horrendous things with such humor and grace and caring and style that will not be there. It will be that over there. And so I have, I just go crazy when I hear people talk about how wonderful assimilation is going to be because we will be invisible again. We assimilated into that society for years and years and hundreds of years. That was us, you know? And it's taken so long for us to say, that's not us, this is us, that we will be giving that up again. But the people who are talking about assimilation do not have the experience or the history before. They just see us standing up and saying, here we are, and they see that world out there railing against us, and wouldn't it be nice if everybody made nice? 
they don't understand the dangers and the loss, the tremendous loss that we will suffer psychologically in our soul if we do that. Well, I found with the women's movement or with women wanting to be equal but not wanting to be part of the women's movement, uh, which was sort of the second, it wasn't even a second wave of feminism, it was like the second thing that came after the second wave. Right. Um, it was interesting to me that they couldn't hold on to this assimilation thing, though, for long. One woman would want to get a job. So we started wearing shoulder pads in our jackets like they did in the 40s when the women were, had to go in and, you know, work. Like, we've got shoulders. And we want choice, which is a very, very important part of feminism, but I always thought some part of it was that the non-pregnant worker was the only kind of worker who was valued that women were in danger of not being hired because everyone knew they could get pregnant. And so we would say, no, 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 <coughs> we're not going to get pregnant. Look, we've got this pill. Right. And so don't worry about it. I'm a non-pregnant worker with shoulders. You won't even notice if I have kids because, God forbid, I'll ask for anything special. I'll be just like them. Right. And so they said, okay, we'll give you a chance. And they hired one, and then they hired two. And it was their mistake when they hired three. Because when three of us got together, we said, That's okay, a I'm group. lying. You know, I want <laughs> child care. I want maternity leave. And we began to understand we cannot be the same. Because we're not the same. No, we're not. And I think it's very much the same with gay and lesbian people, whether it's <laughs> even something so small as putting a picture of your lover on your desk. Because assimilation, in a way, is also dealing with difference whether you know it or not because it's a question as to whether assimilation into a straight culture would allow you to put a picture of your lover on your desk or not because so many people don't that's right and uh, you know people probably are watching this and saying oh well it's great for me at work because people ask me about my partner and they ask me about my kids and i'm very happy but that's not assimilation Mm -mm. That's affirmation. That's what you're talking about. Exactly. I have my picture on my desk. I talk about a lover. I talk about, you know, our family as a family. That's right. So, but do you see a, any, <clears throat> wh which way do you see us going in this? I mean, we've got a strong movement now. We've made some progress. Well, we've, we've made some <clears throat> legislative progress. A um, little bit. Yeah. I, I really worry about where we are going because I spent so many years organizing the grassroots. And you can't have a movement without the grassroots. Sooner or later, the people who have the power are talking to nobody. There's nothing to back them up. And the people with the real power, they get that. They get that. This is a paper tiger we're dealing because there's nobody behind them. And I'm very worried about the way I see our community moving because we're being, um, what's the word, corporatized, we're mm. being incorporated, we're being institutionalized. Um, we have very large community organizations and we have corporates, uh, corporations that we are beholding to on so many levels that I get stuff in the mail and it says, send me a check. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say, meet me on the picket line. You know? mm -hmm. It doesn't say, you know, let's get together and have a rally in the park. You know, it doesn't say, um, we're going to have a town hall meeting. All they ask for is come to a dinner, put on, you know, a, 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 a tux, you know, and the, and the dykes, you can put on a tux, you know, you know mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. go and do this, which leaves a whole bunch of people out because they can't afford it, and which does not get you involved in the issue, it just gets you involved for the evening. And so I worry about that because if anything really came down on us, really bad, we're going to be in, in a state of shock because we don't have the troops. I look upon grassroots people as troops. Well, you know, it's interesting young people who don't have money to write a check, <coughs> who are very radical in their own ways, um, seem to be a growing part of the movement. And there's been organizing done there 
youthful youth organizers. That's great. Uh, organizing themselves. And I see a real kind of ki uh, kinship, I guess, between the young organizers and those of us who've been through a lot of this. I don't know the people sort of in the middle. I, I think of myself as middle-aged, so I don't know what they are. But, you know, the people in the middle so much. Um, I have a hunch, though, having now done political campaign, um, you know, just my own and a few others, that people will show up if you ask them. Uh, and what you're saying, I think, is that we're not really building that. We're not building it at all. As a matter of fact, it's frowned on. It's not encouraged by the large organizations uh, because you might write a check out to a small organization. Right. A right. small group of people. Although there are thousands of these. Now, unfortunately, of course, the time goes by way too fast and there's only a couple of minutes left. So let me ask you one. Oh, no, kind I'm of having such a good time. I know, me too. <laughs> but I'm glad when it goes by too fast because that's the way it should be. Right. Um, <clears throat> do you have any advice for the, this community that you're worried about? I guess, you know, be true to yourself. You know, don't, don't have somebody say to you, you know, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't, you shouldn't look like that. You shouldn't dress that way. You shouldn't go to that bar. You should go to that bar, you know. You know just be true to yourself. And, I mean, that's, that's the best for the world, if, if you would be true to yourself, not just for us, but for all people. We, we fall into all these traps about trying to be somebody we're not. Ivy, thanks so much. I really, really loved having you on the show. Oh, I loved it. Loved having you here, too, and uh, listening in on uh, our conversation with Ivy Bettini. Um, Ivy spent her life as an activist, and uh, I think that it's probably a really good thing when you look back and say, I actually made a difference, and I could actually get used to it.